I'm not sure that's what I set out to do, to put myself in the line of fire. I just was one of the only vocal ones. Because <laughs> there are more, there are more actors out there that could be speaking up. Because I don't look like all Latinas. There are Latinas that don't look like me, that need advocates themselves, that don't see themselves in me. So I go behind the camera, I create opportunities so they can see themselves because I can't always be that reflection. And one human being can't represent an entire community. Gina Rodriguez has a lot to look forward to this year. Her new movie, Miss Bala, is out in theaters and her Carmen Sandiego reboot is streaming on Netflix. Jane the Virgin, the television show that catapulted her to stardom, is coming to an end after five successful seasons. On the day we meet to record this episode, she flew to New York on the red eye from L.A. She spent the morning doing press and being grilled about the perception that her advocacy has missed the mark. We talk about it all and what the past few years have taught her about herself, about family, and about what real power looks like in Hollywood. I'm Alicia Menendez, and this is Latina to Latina. Gina Rodriguez. Yes, voice. You like that? That's my special voice for I you. really enjoy it. Okay. The last time I saw you, you were doing press for a little show called Jane the Virgin. There was a lot of buzz that it was going to be your star turn. Since then, you've won a Golden Globe. You've had breakout roles on the big screen. You got engaged. What about you as a person has changed in that time? Oh, my first feeling was my priorities. Mm. So much of what I had dreamt of when I was younger, as it starts to unfold, I never thought I would be in this space and start to pivot some of those goals elsewhere. I never thought I would say, that maybe I prefer being behind the camera than in front of it. I don't think I ever would have believed myself if I thought I would say that in the future. Jane, I got when I was 29. So my transformation as a woman had already been well in its process, you know? Do you know what I'm talking about? That transformation that we make when we start to like understand the things that we want and that we like and we're not gonna allow that to happen to us anymore and only so much, you know, my favorite is that, like, you only allow somebody to hurt you as much as you'll hurt yourself. And the older you get, that actually gets less and less. And mm-hmm. You're like, I'm not going to hurt myself this much, and I'm not going to let you hurt me this much. And in what ways are you exactly the same person you were four years ago? All of them. Like, pretty much all of the ways. <laughs> like, <laughs> I mean, like, this is me. What you see is what you get. And it ain't going much further than that. And, like, yeah, nothing really has changed in my life, life. Except the fiancé. Except the fiancé, and he's super dope. You've got Ms. Bala out right now. What made you say, yes, this is what I want to do next? I was in search of action. And as a woman, and a Latina woman, there are many opportunities. And not saying opportunities like in general, just like in the genre in particular. But when Sony approached me and they were like, we're going to make this with 95% Latinx in front of him behind the camera and we're going to shoot in Tijuana and there's going to be a female director and we'd like the American girl to be you. I was like, oh shit. You're like, and you're going to pay me? I was like, yeah, real money? <laughs> I was like, for real? And no, it, it completely held up and it was an experience that, I mean, is beyond explanation because I haven't had it before and I haven't had it since. How does it change the actual experience of filming it though? Because usually you're the only person in the room. And on Jane, we have a significant cast of Latinas and Latinos. I would say there's four of us. And then it doesn't really extend too much outside of that. We have Mm -hmm. a very diverse writer's room, thank God, telling the story. Lots of women, lots of women of color. But television sets are predominantly male and predominantly white. That is not to papui on my beautiful white brothers and sisters, but it is just the truth. It's fact. And so to walk on a set and you hear Spanish and English and reggaeton or salsa and cumbia, you see people, you know, making paella or bringing mofongo for lunch. And like you feel like you're at home and you feel this instant safety. You're not an other. There is no otherness. There is just like familiarity 
and the celebration of our similarities and the explanation of our differences and the embracing of them. When you have a film that is priding itself on breaking barriers, in this case because of the number Latinx leads, because of the people behind the camera, is there then more pressure to succeed at the box office? 100%. I mean, like 100%, like no doubt. There was this pressure when I was on Jane the Virgin. Because everybody was like, Jane the Virgin, the synopsis, she gets artificially inseminated. That's dumb. Oh, my God. That's going to be so stupid. And you're just like, oh, ouch. Yikes. Okay. (laughs) Oh, man. (laughs) And it's all Latinas and Latinos. But I wasn't as knowledgeable. So there was a lot more excitement and joy. Now, as someone who produces, knowing what the outcome of the success could be for others. Mm. That's where the pressure comes in Mm -hmm. because I know that if this does well, when this does well, they will create more opportunities for others. Well, you know that well because it's been a long road here. The longest. It's easy to look at you and be like, overnight sensation. Always. They always say that. 34 years old, tried, was broke as hell, living on a sofa, trying my hardest, struggling actor, only the roles that you would repetitively see on screen. And then Jane came and... That created opportunity, but the struggle didn't end. (laughs) You know, auditioning for roles. Listen, I mean, I I auditioned for a role and ended up booking a role that was biographical that I had to fight them to make sure she stayed Latina. She was Mexican from San Diego, and they wanted to change her ethnicity, and it was biographical. (laughs) And I was like, guys, this is straight-up history. This is the one place you actually probably shouldn't do that. Can we just have that one little role? It doesn't have to be me. It could be anyone, Melanie Diaz, or, you know, give it to Natalie Martinez. Give it to Isa Gonzalez. Give it to Dasha Polanco. Give it to give it to a Latina because she was Latina. And, and Ms. Mahler wasn't easy to make, you know? Our budget for an action film was very small, and it was there was a lot of challenges. <laughs> but we fought through it, and we did it. And we're here. And we made a fun film. Let's talk about those years of the hustle. You had real jobs. Um, the most like real a, jobs. A twin nurse. Specialist. What does that even mean? Okay, so my sister got pregnant with twins. She's 10 years older than me. I was a hostess at Sushi Roku, yep. doing massage therapy. I mean, I had all the jobs, right? And then she had twins, and she was like, why don't you help me? Because the people that I want raising my kids with me are family. And I'll pay you for real money. And I was like, you know, like for real nanny money. And so I was like, 100% I'll help you. And and you'll be helping me, right? We'll help each other. And I got, you know, CPR for infants. And I learned how to be a twin specialist, how to feed, burp, sleep two human beings at the same time as being one person. Wow. I've done it with one person. It's really hard. Listen, and I got to go away at the end of the night. I got to give them back to my sister and go home. But because of that, what I realized was there was like a huge demand for twin specialists. And my sister became like part of all these twin groups and all her friends needed a nanny. And I was like, right over here, because they pay big bucks to take care of two kids, <laughs> especially if they live in Beverly Hills. So I was like, hey, I'll take care of your babies. <laughs> um, so I did that for a long time and that was really cool. You win the Golden Globe. You take your parents to the after party. You then go back to your one bedroom. They sleep on the bed and they put me on the couch. <laughs> and my father telling me that night, now, don't you let this go to your head. Remember, your shit does stink. And you got to keep working hard. And you got to prove that you deserve this award. Like, that was the conversation at my house after. You have to prove that you deserve this. So don't stop working hard. It's not done. You're not done. <laughs> and I was like, all right, but I'm done for the night, right? <laughs> Damn. Talk to me a little bit. You've said in the past that it didn't just change things for you. It changed things for your immediate family, and it changed things for your extended family. What does that mean? That means I was able to help them. (laughs) That means I get to take care of my parents now. That means I get to contribute financially in a space that I wasn't able to before. That means I get to help my cousins with student debt. I get to help my sister with student debt. I I got to help myself with student debt. It means that I get to contribute to a family that has supported and uplifted me and protected me and helped me get to this space. So it means exactly what it is. Poor kid gets to help. You Rodriguez girls did good. (laughs) My parents did good. I don't know what they did. Because let's just recount. We've got not only a Golden Globe winner, we've got a Harvard Business School grad. Mm. What is she? she, Private equity. Private equity. She's the CEO of a private equity firm. No big deal. A doctor who runs, she was still running a health clinic? Yeah, Westside Family Health Center, where she helps low-income families. I mean, boom, that is like 
triple threat. I was supposed to be a lawyer. I was supposed to Obviously. be the trifecta, yes. you know, so I, I'm the screw up. Yeah. Minor <laughs> disappointment. No, but tell me what they did. I'm raising a girl. Tell me what they did. So, okay, so me and my sisters always talk about it because my sisters have mad kids and I can't wait to have a kid. God willing, I have that blessing. I think a big thing that my parents did was that they made us realize that the actions that we took, we were the only ones that were going to live those consequences. If we rebelled in school and we didn't do well in school, it wasn't going to affect them. It was going to affect us and our lives. And at a very early age, I knew that, like, my parents were going to be okay was I. I need to take care of myself. I need to learn how to take care of myself. I need to have integrity for the journey I go on. I need to work hard. Because I saw my parents work very hard for very little, and they took lots of pride. And they created three really strong beast women (laughs) that went after what they wanted fully, wholeheartedly, and succeeded. But they made us realize that it was our job to do that. I mean, it, it didn't hurt that my eldest sister was a trailblazer. She went to college, was the first person to go to college in her family. She helped pay for my college tuition when I got sick and I lost my scholarship. She stepped in and helped pay so I can finish NYU. You know, it didn't hurt that my middle sister was going to medical school when I was in high school trying to figure out what I wanted to do. Just to see these two incredible, extraordinary women take, you know, dirt and make it into gold. I was very privileged in that in that right that I had such incredible role models doing what they wanted, going after what they wanted and not letting no stop them. How have you thanked them? Um I don't know. Maybe I should thank them more. Thank you, Rebecca Nevels. <laughs> thank you, thank you. They rock. Do you have siblings? I have an older brother. He can thank me on that. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. If you are as busy as I am, then I have a life hack for you. I've recently been enjoying Green Chef. It's a USDA certified organic company, and they have a diverse array of meal plans with plenty of options to choose from each week. You can choose paleo, vegan, vegetarian, pescatarian, Mediterranean, heart smart, lean and clean, keto, gluten free, and omnivore. For $50 off your first box of Green Chef, go to greenchef.us slash Latina. Their recipes are quick and easy with step-by-step instructions, chef's tips, and photos to guide you along. This week, I made my husband and kiddo salmon and piccata sauce. It tasted fresh and delicious, and my daughter might have even eaten the sauce with a spoon. Best of all, everything is handpicked and delivered right to your door, so no more decision fatigue. Let Green Chef do the meal planning, grocery shopping, and most of the prep for you. For $50 off your first box of Green Chef, go to greenchef.us slash Latina. You're also the voice of the new Netflix animated series, Carmen Sandiego. Did you grow up watching the show, playing the video game? Video game and the game show on PBS with Chief. Chief was my favorite woman alive. Lynn, God rest her soul, also from Chicago. I grew up with the game. My two older sisters grew up with the animation. And then we all had the, like, computer game when we finally got a computer at the house. It must be wild to step into such an iconic character. Wild. And oddly enough, not as much pressure as you would think because we knew nothing about her. Hmm. She didn't really, right? I mean, there was so little bit, and she barely ever spoke. part of her mystique. Yeah. She barely ever spoke. (laughs) She just was like this badass thief. But I remember being Latina and growing up in Jersey and watching and being like, oh, this is the closest thing I have to a Latina on television. And it was Rita Moreno's voice. Yeah. Girl, that's what feels crazy. You're also producing the live-action Carmen Sandiego Netflix film through your production company, I Can and I Will Productions. How will audiences know that this is something that Gina had a hand in? Oh, I don't know if they'll ever know unless they're on the set with gender parity, making sure that women are in the helm of many of the roles that we often haven't gotten the opportunity to, the fact that it'll be intersectional, the fact that I will put them in places they haven't had the opportunity to before, that stuff will be a little bit more behind scenes. That's the stuff that I think really helps push the needle forward. But then on screen, it will be a multicultural, beautiful cast for sure. 
Yeah, I think the what I realized as an actor, for so long I thought if I was on screen that I would be a reflection and I would help create change. And then I got on screen and I was like, oh, wow, there actually aren't many more and mm-hmm. we're still like 7% of speaking roles. Not much has changed. Oh, that's right, because that's not where the power lies. It's behind the camera. And that's what made me start producing. Because I was like, I don't have any control on this side of the camera. On this side of the camera, my face is a reflection for those that feel like they look like me. But if I want to be an advocate for the entire Latinx community, I got to go behind the camera. It's a huge mind shift. I also wasn't aware of the dynamics of set and Hollywood and show business. I just was like, I want to be an actor. Mm-hmm. You know, I want to act one day. I want to play pretend. And I really enjoy playing pretend, and I want to continue to play pretend. But if I want to create change, I got to do it behind the camera. What have you learned about what real power looks like, specifically in Hollywood? I'm not exactly sure what you're looking for in terms (laughs) of an answer, but I can say that as Jane, when I was playing Jane, I did think the power was my face on that screen. And I learned very quickly that that was not where the power lied. I learned very quickly that I could not help my fellow artists just as the lead on a TV show. I could not change the fact that we didn't have gender parity. I couldn't change the fact that there weren't more Latinos or Latinas. I figured out pretty quickly that I needed to create a production company because as much as I thought my reflection was going to be powerful, which I do think that it helped many young girls feel of value, My power for the entire Latinx community is behind the camera. So what power looks like is not what we all think it is. And right now it's in the hands of very few, and they look very similar to one another. And we're just going to keep inching our way in there to create a little more quality, a little more opportunity, a little more fairness, so we can see more stories, so we can see more reflections, so we can see other dimensions of human beings. In addition to all of your television and film work, you've become known for having taken on this mantle of being an advocate for diversity in Hollywood. I definitely didn't take it on. (laughs) Really? You feel that way? I didn't take it on. I just spoke up when I had a chance to. And I was probably one of the only ones that was doing it. And so I think the mantle was placed on me. (laughs) Hmm. Because I definitely never set out to be a vocal advocate I set out to use my platform to help create change. It was kind of more the fact that there are so few of us. It's a very dangerous space to live in. To speak out for others is very scary. Anybody that does it, it's very scary. You put yourself in the line of fire. I'm not sure that's what I set out to do, to put myself in the line of fire. I'm definitely used to taking the hits. But that being said, I just was one of the only vocal ones. (laughs) Because there are more more actors out there that could be speaking up. Because I don't look like all Latinas. There are Latinas that don't look like me, that need advocates themselves, that don't see themselves in me. So I go behind the camera. I create opportunities so they can see themselves. Because I can't always be that reflection. And one human being can't represent an entire community. It's not fair to the community. It's not fair to the person. So I don't think I set out to do that. (laughs) I think I just was vocal because not many others were. Is there anything you would do differently? Or are there lessons you have learned? Lessons I have learned. Because my heart's intention was misconstrued. The facts were real. The facts hurt people. And unfortunately, those facts came out of my mouth. You're talking about the the pay equity scenario. So the sad situation is that truth hurts. And I get that. And I'm learning that we are definitely in a climate where I must be very clear, so clear, the most clear so that I'm not misunderstood. And that's for my mental health, because I know my intention. And I sadly know that some facts really suck. Well, there's that 
And there's also, I've had to learn as someone who also wants to be a good ally that sometimes my intention and the way my intention lands mm, of course, has unintended consequences. 100%. That's just life though, right? And I got to own that yeah. and I got to learn from that. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. And I think that we as a culture, we are in a space where we don't fully read or fact check or do our research, but we own feelings based off of 170 characters, and we own them as fact. And that's very dangerous. Broadening out from here, what has surprised you most about becoming a public person? How much I hate it. (laughs) (laughs) It's Hmm. not normal. It's not natural. The positive and the negative in that multitude is not healthy. I set out to be an actor. I didn't set out for anything else. I didn't set out to be famous on Instagram. I didn't set out to, you know, to be a representative of a community. I didn't I set out to be an actor. I set out to play pretend. I wanted to do roles I hadn't seen yet. I wanted to see my community reflected in spaces it hadn't been in yet. And there was so much like an Apple contract that you don't read and you swipe swipe swipe, swipe, swipe all the way down to the bottom and you're just like, agree. We all do it every day. I Get know. on your new iPhone. Oh, ding, 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 ding. Agree. And then you just don't know what you're agreeing to. I want to thank you because you've been really clear about the fact that you want to be a mom. Yes. And I know that that is a hard thing to put out into the universe. Yeah, because it's scary, right? Like, I just, I hope my body is capable of doing that. Especially, can we talk a little bit about you being sick? I mean, you manage an illness on top of everything else. Yeah, it's a poopy one. But it's okay. But I'm all right. And I'm living. And so I definitely don't want to woe is me. But Hashimoto's is a son of a bitch. Such a pain. Yeah. Because we think of it in terms of weight gain. Yeah, that's that's a side effect and a very, very real one. But someone that is, I've definitely come into my skin of being very comfortable with the fluctuation of my weight, with knowing and learning my body and how it works and uh, what foods to put in my body. And then at times to be okay with what my body looks like because of what I'm currently doing. I eat like if I'm on Jane, 14 hours a day, I'm not working out. I'm not. And that's okay. My priority is Jane. So my body is going to look different. And I, that's okay. And I love that. Yeah. And it would be hard, but it is in your industry. It is a <sighs> different ballgame. Oh, my God. I, when I got to Hashimoto's, I was 19 years old. And I was like, I was cursed. This is a curse. Mm. This is a curse because I'm never going to be super skinny. I'm never going to be these super skinny girls that you see on TV. And mind you, when at 19, that was in... God, it was like 2002 or something like that, right? So we didn't have body positivity back then. We were not calling out people that body shamed. Those images were prevalent, and they did not look like me, and my body type was not the ones being lifted as beautiful. And that takes a toll on a young woman and a young man and just about anybody. That takes a toll on you. So I definitely thought I was like cursed in the beginning, and then it became my superpower. It became like... The reason I started advocating for, like, different beauty norms and body positivity. And that was part of, you know, a big part of my advocacy back when I had done Philly Brown and when nobody cared what I said. (laughs) I interviewed Christy Habegger at CAA. Oh, Christy. She's the best. And she said to me, Salma and Jen and America and Ava and Gina, pound for pound, they are smarter, tougher harder working in part because nobody was going to hand them anything. Hmm. Yeah, that's just so real. And nobody's handing us anything today either. (laughs) Let me tell you something. You know, I'm busting my ass to get this movie out. I'm busting my ass to finish this, Jane. Busting my ass to try to make opportunities for others and opportunities for myself. It's like, it, yeah. But... The great thing about all of us is that we were taught how to do hard work. We ain't no stranger to it, and all of us like it, so we're going to be okay. It's the last season of Jane the Virgin. You ready for it to end? Yeah. Yeah. I took every moment, and I held it with such gratitude and such appreciation. There has not been a minute that has gone by that I've been like, ugh, well, ugh. I've been like, another day, another day with Jane. I get to do this. I'm so lucky I get to do this. So there is not 
a bit of me that will have any regret. I have soaked every moment up. Judah, thank you so much. Thank you. I know you have a busy life, so let me make getting to our show even easier. You can catch us through your smart speakers. That's right. Google and Alexa know what's up. Just say, play Latina to Latina podcast to your Echo, Google Home, or whatever setup you have, and make your cooking, cleaning, or relaxing at home more interesting. Thanks for joining us today. Latina to Latina was originally co-created with Bustle. Now the podcast is owned and executive produced by Juleka Lentigua williams and me. Maria Muriel was the sound designer on this episode. We want to hear from you. Tell us who you want to hear from and how you're making the show a part of your life. Email us at hola at latinatolatina.com. Remember to subscribe or follow us on Radio Public, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you're listening. 